Despierta. ¿Sabes qué día es hoy? Vas a transformar al mundo haciendo lo que amas. Vas a cambiar las reglas del juego. Vas a mover a otros. Busca, crea, innova, vuela. El mundo te espera. Transformar. Hazlo, UPAEP. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here with us. Thank you, Charlie, for being here and sharing your time with us. As hopefully was uh, evident from the title of the talk and the background and everything, we're going to get to stretch our English muscles today a little bit. <laughs> so this won't be, you know, just another fun YouTube video. This is time to, to do a little bit of learning together. Today we have the extreme pleasure of having uh, Charles Galindo with us, who began his career as a well site geologist searching oil and gas in remote areas of Latin America and in Texas, both on and off. Uh, both on and offshore petroleum exploration platforms. He left the petroleum industry in 1983 and began working at the NASA Johnson Space Center as a lunar laboratory sample processor, beginning a 30-year career there. And, I mean, this is a really long list of accomplishments by Charlie, <laughs> so we're going to spend less time hearing from me and more time hearing from Charlie about all the wonderful things he did and then how that's brought him here to Upaip and what he's planning to do here and with the work and science still ahead of him. So Charlie, thank you very much. We'd like to remind everybody that we are transmitting live for the video conference and then for the YouTube recording. So both the people that are joining us by video conference and everybody here, if you have a participation, a question, you can send it by the chat or you can you know, raise your hand, uh, turn on the microphone, we'll all be able to hear you. And then at the end of your participation, you can turn the microphone back off. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you, We look Johnny. forward to this conference. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, conference on the importance of STEM through the eyes of a planetary scientist. So what I want to talk to you today is about my past experiences as a planetary scientist and then tell you a little bit about what I'm doing here. So what it, what, for those that don't know what STEM is, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. These are the basics of everything that we do today, from talking on our cell phones to watching TV. It's all due to satellites, to NASA's early inventions, the miniaturization of electronics, the speed of electronics have all been driven by space and by technology. So why STEM? Well, one of the things that we did with STEM was we explored the moon. We were able to, to figure out how to, to leave our own planet, to leave the gravitational pull of our own planet, and, and make it to another, another body, and that was the moon. So let's talk a little bit about the moon. From 1968 to 1972, we went to the moon. We landed on the moon six times. We had three orbiters, and we're going to call Apollo 13 orbiter. Does there, er, anybody or everybody know what uh, happened with Apollo 13? Well, that was one, the one that didn't quite make it, but made it back, and that's where the saying failure is not an option came from, from mm -hmm. the early uh, mission controller at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, from 1969 uh, to 1972, we brought back 382 kilograms of lunar sample. This was accomplished by human beings actually being on the surface of the moon. The Russians also brought back a small amount of samples as well, but they did it remotely. And we shared these samples between many of us. There was a controversy a while back about whether or not we actually went to the moon. Well, let me tell you that we did go to the moon. We have samples. We have, like I say, uh, 382 kilograms. I'm used to saying 842 pounds, but anyway, 382 382 kilograms of rock stored at the uh, two thirds are stored at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where I worked, and then another third is stored in another site in case something ever occurred to the ones that are stored at NASA. We'd always have some samples. They also gave samples to just uh, to every country at the time as well. So there are many samples that are there. Probably is a sample somewhere here in Mexico at probably one of the museums of, of the Moon. So we did share the samples. Um, let me see if I can find the point. I guess this is red thing. Yeah. So here's, here's the side of the moon that we see, and then here's the far side of the moon that we, we can't see. We never see this side. 
The reason we have this photograph is because we've had orbiters go around the moon and take these pictures. If it wasn't, again, for STEM, for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we would not be able to do these things. Here's a picture of, <coughs> of one of the early astronauts on the surface of the moon. They took a lunar rover. That way they could travel further the distance. When they first, Apollo 11, they were very worried about landing on the moon. It was the first time a human being had ever been off the Earth. And so they were very cautious. As time went on around Apollo 15, they, they had designed this moon buggy so they could travel further away and collect samples. The whole purpose was to collect samples from different parts of the moon. So again, again, here's a, a closer, closer look at the, the lunar buggy. And to this day, it's still up there. And so not too long ago, I think it was one of the Indian uh, uh, orbiters that actually s took pictures of it. And you can still see the tracks because there is no atmosphere. So anything that was there since the 60s or 68 is still there in the same position. It hasn't moved. So I guess there's no uh, moon men or moon women there to, to move things around. Also, uh, what, what the astronauts did while they were there, they went to s different areas to collect different parts of the moon so that we could better understand how our solar system was developed, how, how it started. The thing about the moon is that there is no atmosphere. On Earth, there's atmosphere. On Earth, there's water. There's uh, oxygen. On the moon, there isn't. So th with water and oxygen, you have changes in the chemistry of, of the, the samples. So what we have from the moon are the pristine samples that are the original pieces of our solar system. So that's one of the reasons why they're very important. We can see, we can find out information about it, how our solar system formed by understanding these, these particular samples more than the samples on Earth that have been changed. An example of change on Earth is clay. Now you don't have clay on, on the moon because there's no water. Clay is a pr uh, produced by water, uh, reacting with the rock. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a small video to show you. I think I'm going to have to probably start from here. Uh, let's see if we can. This is actually an astronaut on the surface of the moon. And what, what you notice is that he has a different, for some reason there's no sound. Maybe it's because I need to raise the sound. I don't hear any sound, but yeah, there's no sound. But anyway, what you notice here is that he's having a difficult time because of the difference in gravity. The moon is much smaller, and so it's like one-sixth the gravity of the Earth. And so you can see he's trying to get back up on his feet after falling. He was trying to collect a sample, and it took him a little bit of time to get back up. But he did. And that was another fear. What happens if something occurs to an astronaut while he's on the surface? Who's going to rescue him? So they had to be very careful with everything they did at that time. So from, from the, the, the missions, the six missions that actually landed on the moon and collected the samples, they were brought back to the lunar laboratory. Yes. And here's an example of a lunar sample. This is a, uh, from Apollo 14. You can tell by the number there. The 14 in front tells you the Apollo number. And then 305 was the location. So every rock has a location where it was found. And this is important because that way, if you study the, the, study the sample, you understand what, where it came from. And it could come from the side of a crater. It could come from, from different sources. So that was one, one reason why all the samples have really specific numbers. And also another thing that you can see here is this little, uh, the little cube there. That cube has a T on it which means this is the top right here. Mm -hmm. So it has a T, it has a B, it has a north and south and as well. So that way they can ad un also understand its position on the surface of the, Earth, on the m surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is, is there's cosmic rays that are, and, and solar winds that are always bombarding the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. So this way we would know it, how those affect those samples by looking at, mm -hmm. at, 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 by understanding its orientation. So my very first job at NASA Johnson Space Center was working in the curation laboratory. 
And as you can see here, you have to wear these bunny suits. It's a, it's a clean room, a class 10,000 clean room. And what that means is only 10,000 particles that are allowed inside that room. The samples are never out in the atmosphere. And the reason for that is to keep them pristine. You want to make sure that what you're studying, what the scientists are studying, is what was actually on the moon and has not been changed because of the Earth's atmosphere. So the samples are stored in these, these chambers here, these, uh, uh, they're called glove boxes. You can't really tell right here, but these little round things come off and there's gloves that pop out. They're positive pressure, uh, so that way that uh, nothing goes in. So what you're doing is you're protecting the samples. When they first came back, they weren't sure what they were gonna bring back with them. So they, were had, they had everything under negative pressure. The astronauts, when they first came back, they had them in quarantine for quite a while to make sure they didn't bring any Andromeda strains back or any kind, of, you know, any kind of bacteria or any other type of uh, mm -hmm. disease from another planet. We didn't know what we were getting into when we first went to the moon. So all the samples are in these, in these particular chambers here that are filled with nitrogen. Also, another thing about these chambers are is that only a certain types of materials, materials are allowed insi inside because a lot of the work that we do is on, on nanoscales and parts per million, parts per billion. So just the slide, uh, 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 a ring, for instance, uh, a gold ring, your wedding ring, cannot go into the laboratory. It has to be covered because just the, the minimal amount of any material could change the chemistry at the levels that we, we analyze these materials. So here's just a, a picture of three, three, of, uh, three uh, sample processors, myself and two other friends. Very diverse group, of course. That's why they take these pictures, to show how diverse NASA is. <laughs> and you can see that uh, it's a very diverse group. Again, you can, inside here, there's actually a, a lunar sample. Again, you never touch them, so they're inside here, and so you work inside gloves. What's interesting, though, is that uh, well, you really can't see. Well, sort of here on the side, you can kind of see that there's a, a compartment. So what happens is you, you take the sample out of a vault. The vault is back in this room over here, and that's where all the samples are stored. Each one is stored in a particular place. You pull the sample out. It's got several bags on it. There's a, there's a, this is a U-shaped uh, uh, hallway around this laboratory, and on the outside are, are the, the uh, airlocks. So you open the airlock, you place, you cut off a, a, the, the bag with an, another Teflon glove on the gloves that you already have on. You take that, that, that rock out and you put it into the airlock. You close the airlock and then you purge it with nitrogen for about five minutes or so, several minutes. And then once you purge it, then you're allowed to open up the, cham the inside chamber and bring the rock in. Once you bring the rock in, then there's a, you got to cut off another bag. There's another bag there that you cut off. And inside that bag, there's either a sample or it's in another container, depending on what type of rock it is. But it's a long process. And so this is what l lunar uh, sample processors did. They were the ones that, that took the care and feeding of the samples. Any scientist that came in and wanted to work on these samples was, was not allowed to uh, touch them. The, the lunar processors were the ones that touched them for them. I did a lot of band sawing where I actually took the samples and cut them in pieces using a band saw that actually was a Hobart uh, meat saw. Everything stainless steel was one of the allowable um, materials inside because there is no stainless steel in our solar system. It's made, it's human made, so we know that. Teflon was another one at that time that we thought wasn't important because Teflon is organic, but now we know that there are organics on other planets, so that would be a no-no now if we were studying Martian materials. So there was a lot that we learned. So aluminum was also allowed inside these uh, chambers because there's a quite a bit of aluminum throughout our solar system. One thing that I always wanted, what, that I've always done since the very beginning of, of my career was bring students into the laboratory. I've worked 30 years with students. That was my main focus, my main passion was getting students involved in STEM. And so many, many times I brought them into the laboratory, as you can see here. They went through the whole process of putting on the bunny suits, learning how to, to go through the, get into the laboratory, and actually seeing the lunar samples close up, something that many students will never do. And I've had many students come back later on in life and tell me, thank you for doing that. It really changed my life. 
it's they, it is a life changing situation when you're able to go into something like this that no one else is able to go into. So I tried to bring as many students and as many Latino students as I could. I had a passion for Latino students, uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, is because I wanted to share what I knew with my community, with my with my um, uh, future, my my generation. A lot of the the instruments that I used were uh, for analyzing samples. And this, this particular one is called an electron microprobe. And it's an interesting uh, um, uh, instrument because it bombards the sample with uh, x-rays. These x-rays, when they bounce off, uh, they give you, by, by bouncing off a, an, an unknown uh, concentration or a, a, what we call a standard, we are able to infer the amount of iron or the amount of chromium or whatever. One of the things shown here is a, it are, these are um, uh, elemental maps. And so you can see the redder the, uh, the redder the material, the more of that element is in there. So for instance, manganese here, is, there's quite a bit of manganese there. Aluminum, uh, very little aluminum, and some of them chromium. But you can see the different colors. These are called false color images where you assign a color to a particular element with the, the reds being the, the more abundant and then your, the darker colors, your less abundance. Another uh, instrument that I use is a polarized, uh, electron micro, uh, polarized light microscope. And what this did is it cross-polarized light. So for instance, you can have, you have uh, for instance, sunglasses that are polarized that allow only certain um, wavelengths to come in. Well, what this does, it, it reacts with the minerals. And so it allows you to distinguish one mineral from another. So that's why you see all these different colors. It's called birefringence, is the word, the terminology, terminology used. But it occurs when you cross-polar the two, the two light sources. You mix those light sources together. And so here you can see plain polarized and then cross-polarized. And so you really stand out. The minerals really stand out, and you're able to... Uh, to determine what minerals are there. So let's talk a little bit now about the samples that were brought back. One of the samples that brought back is this vesicular basalt, and it was from Apollo 15, and then, then at Station 16. Wait, the first thing you notice are all the, all the different holes here. These holes were created because gases, when this rock formed, it was uh, basaltic, uh, volcanic in, in origin. And there was a lot of gases in it. So as the gases escape, the, that's where you see all these different, these different uh, holes here. That's going to be an important um, 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 piece of information later on when I talk about a Martian rock in a bit. Again, you can see here, the, 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 this is the bottom of it. So the top would have been on the other side. Again, you always know where that location is. Here's how geologists talk about samples. They always talk in, in terms of oxide weights, weight percents. So the majority of these are going to be silicon and aluminum. Uh, and then you'll see different changes. In, and for instance, calcium is an interesting one here, and I'll show you why in a minute. And then you can see sodium is, is very rare on the moon. That's one of the rare uh, uh, m m um, elements that you would find. But mainly silicon. Titanium is an important uh, element because that could possibly be used for uh, for construction if we ever decided to construct something on the surface of the moon. This is an anorthosite. Notice right away the difference in color. And so what I want to point out is the amount of calcium. This is very high in calcium. Calcium just as our bones have a lot of calcium, calcium phosphate. Well, this has a lot of calcium in it. It's a white color, as you can see. One thing you can notice here are these really small kind of holes there. Those are micrometeorite impacts. A lot of times, you can't see them too well here, but if you can look closely at them in a microscope, you could pro probably see that they are filled with glass. And what has occurred, because there is no atmosphere on the surface, on the, on the moon, that any, any size meteorite or meteor, because I guess we call meteorites when they hit the Earth's atmosphere, any, any meteor of any, any size can hit the surface and create these, these uh, they're called micrometeorites impacts or, or impacts in, in general. This is a lunar breccia. 
this lunar breccia is around 3.9 to 4.2 billion years old. Our solar system is about 4.5, or 4.6 billion is kind of where we average it out at. Some of the oldest r known rocks are 4 point, uh, 4, just about 4 billion years old, but they have found in zircons. Zircons are a very resistant mineral, and so if you find a zircon, you want to date the, those zircons because the zircons will actually tell you the actual date of the material because they do not change. They're, they're very uh, inert compared to the other ones. So you can see that the zircon is almost as, as old as, as, as the solar system, 4.6, this is 4.4 billion uh, that we found on Earth. But normally most of the, the rocks on Earth are around 4 billion, 3.8 to 4 billion. Oh, also, this is an interesting rock. It's a breccia. A breccia is a combination of rocks. So this particular rock occurred because of an impact. So some large meteor, asteroid, something bombarded the surface of the moon and, and melted this rock, m melted many rocks together. And so that's why you also get this 3.9 to 4.2 billion year uh, range because there's more than one type of rock in here. And as, as you can see, there's white, and there's dark, and it looks very different. So this particular rock is created by an impact. Lunar soils as well. If you think about an Earth soil, you think about organics, you think about water, you think about um, plant material, all changing the structure of rocks. But there is none of this on the moon. So how is a lunar soil made? It's made by impacts. That's basically the only way that the, this material can be formed because there is, there is no wind, there is no atmosphere, there is no water. So what would cause this impacts? And so one of the interesting things you see in these impacts are these circular glass features. So again, when you've had an impact, it, it, there's so much pressure and so much heat that you create these little, little glass b b uh, bubbles. And then again, it here's a little bit about the, uh, the geology or the chemistry of the rocks itself. So now that we've talked about breccias, let's go and talk a little bit about asteroids and impacts. So one of the uh, theories today is that the extinction of the dinosaurs occurred because of a major impact and a major impact here in Mexico in Chicxulub. And this is an example of what they think the Chicxulub uh, crater would have looked like at that period of time. It's interesting because you cannot see Chicxulub from the surface. The, the way this was found, and actually she's a friend of mine, and Adriana Ocampo, she was l observing um, different um, cenotes from space. She was looking at space uh, images and she noticed this circular feature of cenotes. And so she started thinking, well, why, why the circular feature? And then she started thinking about impacts. And so they started doing studies in the area, and they actually went, Bemex had done some drilling out here. So they went and they looked at the, the cores that they had, had um, uh, cored out at the time, and they found iridium. Iridium is a, a rare element on Earth, but it's, it's found more abundance in, in, in space or in, in meteorites. So we knew that this, this iridium had to come from somewhere, this iridium anonymously. So they found that, as well as some of the rocks itself, when there is an impact, it changes the structure of the rock. So for instance, uh, if you have something like a, a, a silicon dioxide, a quartz crystal, most people know where quartz is, but there's other forms of quartz that have been, that have been uh, changed because the structure has changed. The coacite and suavocite are two of the types of quartz that are changed because of impact. And so again, we found these particular types of minerals inside there as well that told us that there, there, there is probably, and we're almost certain that, that there was a major impact here at, at Chicxulub, which was probably the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Again, when this impact occurred, it changed, there was climatic change. There was quite a few changes that, that the dinosaurs were not uh, able to, um, to withstand, which was fortunate for us because the mammals did survive be during that period of time. Another thing is uh, there's a, also many, many craters on the surface of the, of the Earth. This one's in Meteor Crater in Arizona that you can go visit. And there's actually a, a museum up here on top. And it's one of the smaller impacts on, on the Earth. There's many other impacts throughout 
on the Earth's surface, as well as uh, the, the moon. As you see the pictures of the moon, you see impacts all over the place, as well as on, um, on other planets, on Mars, and, and many other planets and moons. So from meteorites, uh, again, an impact occurred somewhere, and these, these meteorites have fallen all over the place. One thing that we do is that every year we send a group of scientists to Antarctica to find me to look for meteorites. Well, you're wondering, well, why Antarctica? Well, for one thing, it's all white, and there's not very many rocks out there. So if you find a rock, it has to come from somewhere. There are meteor wrongs, but the majority of the things you would find are meteorites. And so they go every year. Uh, National Science Foundation funds a group of scientists to go every year. You can actually sign up yourself if you'd like to go, and, and, and you may be chosen uh, if you have some kind of field experience, or they look for different types of people for different reasons, so mainly psychological ones as well, because you're, you're stuck with someone in a tent for quite a, few year, quite a few weeks. So they land, and then they have skidoos that they travel around and to search for the meteorites. And this is the way that they live for uh, six weeks, usually during the summertime, which is uh, December through January, so they miss Christmas. They normally spend Christmas up there. And you live in tents, and sometimes you don't come out of your tents for days because the, the, the weather is so bad. Again, a uh, very important piece of equipment there. That's your latrine right there. Look for a spot, use that. So anyway, uh, this is kind of where you would live if you lived on, in Antarctica for short periods of time. And here they are actually going around looking for meteorites in different areas. And one of the things that we did find is a Martian meteorite. And so this was, this changed the way we looked at meteorites because we had been collecting meteorites for many, many years, but we never thought that we had meteorites from other planets until we found this particular one. This Martian meteorite has these little gl glass globules in there. Some of the scientists in, in, in the uh, building that I work uh, had uh, the ability to extract those gases and do analysis of the gases that were captured inside these uh, glass bubbles. So imagine a, uh, if you blow a bubble here on Earth, uh, what would be inside of it? Our atmosphere, right? Well, that's exactly what's occurred here. The atmosphere of Mars has been trapped inside these bubbles. And so they were able to extract those, and then they compared it to elements that they had seen from other Mars landers. So many times they've, uh, they've sent Mars landers to the surface of, of the, uh, uh, to Mars to, and they've analyzed the atmosphere. And so by, by doing a, a uh, comparison of uh, the Martian atmosphere with what they found, in, it's called the Shigrati glass, uh, they were able to match up this, this uh, there was a, the uh, matchup of the two uh, concentrations and the types of ga uh, gases that allowed them to infer again that these were Martian meteorites. Once they found Martian meteorites though, then they started looking for other types of meteorites as well. And so now we also know we have lunar meteorites, so we have pieces of the moon. And then who knows if there's Earth meteorites on some other planet, we don't know. They found several meteorites on Mars, but, but they haven't been able to examine them the way they can here. And so I, I'm not sure if they were iron meteorites or whatever. Iron meteorites are the more common meteorites they come from cores. Okay, so what next? So we've we've gone to Mars. We know there's these meteorites. We think there could be life on other planets. So why not explore? So how would we explore going to another planet? Well, first of all, you have to think about the environment you're going to. So here's a uh, here's a, a, a lunar. Um, uh, miner and his boro, and they're both in their in their uh, their suits, and they're going to be looking for s samples here. So if we did live on other planets, how would we live on other planets? What would, what what would we how would we survive living on, for instance, the moon where there is no atmosphere? Well, we have to create our own atmospheres. That's one thing. We couldn't live on the outside. When we came on the outside, we had to be in a suit, as you saw the early uh, missions, uh, the astronauts. So this is an artist's rendition of what a lunar um, uh, base may look like. Here's some other examples of lunar bases. I like this picture because it kind of shows 
Well, for one, for one thing here, they're using actually uh, lunar soil to protect them from radiation, and they're bagged and, and enclosed in, or also they could live inside a, maybe a, some type of a cave, some way to protect them from the radiation that, that's bombarding the, the surface of the moon constantly, again, because there's no atmosphere or there's no magnetic field. We're, we're, we're fortunate that we have a magnetic field that protects us from a lot of these cosmic rays and, and solar winds. But uh, if you look closely, you can see that they're growing. They have an area to grow food. Uh, they have sleeping quarters, and they have gymna uh, gymnasium, everything you can. Here's the airlock. Just, just like at the samples from the moon, you would need an airlock. So you'd go in from here, allow it to pressurize before you go to the next airlock, and then you take off, done, where they say done your, your, uh, your suit, and then from there, once that was pressurized to the right, then you could open it and go inside without contaminating the inside of the um, base. Other examples of being ways to be protected from radiation. And the easiest way is not to bring something. And that's one thing we try not to do. We don't want to bring things from Earth to wherever we're going to go. If we're going to go to the moon, we're going to go to Mars. The cost of bringing things to another planet is very expensive. The weight is, is uh, expensive. So what we want to do is use what they call in situ uh, materials. So in situ soil, covering your, uh, your environment will help you, protect you from the uh, solar winds or the cosmic rays or radiation. So what else? So also important uh, to live on another planet would be oxygen. So how can we produce oxygen on a regular basis. Well, one way would be is to grow plants. And so that was one of the jobs that I had was developing soils, and I'll talk about that in a minute, in order to grow plants, in order to produce oxygen. And it's also a carbon dioxide scrubber. So it removes carbon dioxide. As you know, we breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Well, plants need carbon dioxide, so they take the carbon dioxide and they convert it to oxygen. So there's a symbiotic relationship when you're in an enclosed environment where you're allowed, where the plants and the humans react and help each other survive. And so this is a good way for that type of relationship to occur. What also uh, I'm going to show you here is, is the crew also has waste. And so what do we do with the waste? Well, everything has to be recycled. Because uh, again, you, you don't want to waste anything. So we had a whole process of recycling uh, dirty waters and producing clean waters again. Just kind of, well, not not exactly because you're enclosed inside a a a, uh, a a chamber, right? So terraformation would be you would try to develop something on the outside. That would, it takes millions and millions of years. If you think of the Earth and how it occurred, how there was an oxygen originally on Earth. There was something that was formed, I think, by cyanobacteria, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later, uh, that uh, helped occur, that helped the oxygen form on the Earth. So it, it would take millions of years for it to form. So that's something that would take, you know, it wouldn't be in lifetimes or generations. It would be very long per periods of time to change. This is just another example of an uh, instrument that I use. This is an X-ray diffractometer. And what we were looking at here is another way to produce water from rocks. So if, if you had a, a rock that has iron oxide in it and you were able to separate those two, then you'd have the oxygen. You could use that for producing uh, water if you had a, a source of hydrogen, which you do from the sun. And so what we're doing here is, is uh, actually heating these samples to see where we would have to go. How much, how much energy would be required to produce water from rocks? And so we went through this process. And what they would do, they would send these samples to me, and then I would run them in this X-ray diffractometer. And then I would notice as the temperatures decreased that the iron would disappear. And so this was one way we could tell if the process was working. Um, and this is another example of a different type of rock. This one doesn't have the heat, the, 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 the heat there. But you can also see, again, uh, this particular magnetite is uh, iron oxide. So that's what we were looking at, this loss of the iron oxide as you went through these different heats, heating purposes. So 
uh, in order to live on another planet, also we wanted to develop s specific types of soils, these synthetic soils that we could use, try to develop the soils from the samples there on the, on the plant, planet itself or bring some of the soil with us. So what we used is called zeoponics, and zeoponics, a zeolite, is a very unusual rock, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute, but this is an example of some of the different experiments we did. This one actually went into space, and, and, and it was in the space, uh, space sh uh, shuttle at that time, and it actually grew plants in space uh, using this system. So we did develop a system that would be able to be used on the original um, uh, lunar bases or Mars bases, and then finally the, the more permanent ones. So let me talk a little bit about the zeoponic plant system. So we created, so we, we, uh, we uh, looked for a particular rock, zeolite, and that particular rock, in a minute I'll show you why, but we, what we could do is we could take what was on the rock, most zeolites have either calcium or sodium on them, and we could remove that calcium and sodium and bombard it with either potassium and ammonium. And, and in a minute, I'll show you again the, the rock itself and, and why this works. But it w the potassium and the ammonium would stay on the rock. And so when you look at a, uh, at a fertilizer, you'll see that fertilizers, that, uh, if you look at the, the bag, it will have an NPK. So you're, you're always looking at nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium. And so that's what we did. We created our own synthetic soil with potassium and ammonium coming from the zeolite, and then we created a synthetic apatite. An apatite is the same material as your bones, calcium phosphate, and what we did is took, removed the calcium and bombarded it with all these other different major, minor, and trace elements that, that plants need in, in a chemical reaction so that the, the apatite that was created had all these different elements in the structure itself. Then we also, when you added water, then all of a sudden you had this, this, this combination of the zeolite with the apatite, and all of a sudden you started getting these reactions. And so what we noticed that when, when the water uh, dissolved the apatite, which was m much more dissolvable, it released all these different elements here, which pushed off as the elements increased, it would push off the potassium and the, and the ammonium. So you would have this uh, slow-release fertilizer that occurred. We did this for many, many years, and uh, we were getting fair results, uh, but we were using um, well, sterile soils. So on Earth, again, we have these little critters called microbes, bacteria, that really make a difference. And so we found out that, that by adding bacteria to our synthetic soils and converting the ammonia to the nitrates and nitrites that the plants need into a form that they could use, that we could actually have better production growth uh, more. And the way we, we measured the growth was more by the amount of seeds that we pr were produced and, um, and the, green, green, uh, the amount of green as well. Okay, about the zeolites I was talking about. So zeolites are a silicon oxide, a silicon uh, silicate and an aluminum uh, a combination. So you can see here these, th and they, they form these little um, kind of uh, um, they're, well, they're like molecular sieves, so they have holes inside of them. And so inside these holes, though, because the silica and the aluminum, uh, when they're combined together, there's a negative charge that is, uh, that's loose. And so it, it attra that's what attracts the ammonia or the calcium or whatever cation that you need. And so the cations actually stay inside the, the structure. And so, again, this is what allowed us to, to create the slow-release fertilizer. And here's just some pictures of, of the zeolite, what it looks like in natural form. And then again, here is a scanning electron microscope image of it. And you can kind of see these little guys here. Those are actually zeolites. So what we did then is we started um, growing plants, different types of plants. These, this particular, we were growing a lot of wheat. Uh, I think it was the University of Utah uh, created this really miniature wheat because we wanted small small plants to take up in space, uh, so it wouldn't take up space. <laughs> and so we did a lot of our experiments in these, these particular types of uh, chambers. The chambers we would put, uh, uh, we would uh, 
and increase the carbon dioxide because plants like carbon dioxide. And so we actually controlled the lighting. We controlled the, the temperature to, per, to, to get the best production we could. And then also we worked with the zeolites, the zeoponics, to see what, what, what would work the best. And here's some examples of some of the, some of the different plants that we were growing, lettuce, of course, uh, um, different types of potatoes. And you can't see very well here, but there were, these are the controls. So this is just standard uh, soils. And then the different types of zeolites at different levels. And you can see we got much better production from the synthetic soils that we were producing. And here's a larger chamber, uh, a 10-foot chamber that we actually were growing uh, lettuce in to see how much oxy oxygen could be produced. Well, why would we want to do that? Because we locked someone up the inside there for 15 days with the only oxygen being produced by these wheat plants. So this young man here took very good care of those wheat plants because that just kept him alive for 15 days. So uh, he... Uh, he stayed in there for 15 days. There was no exchange, everything. It was sealed, a closed chamber for those 15 days. And the only oxygen that he uh, was breathing was a, the oxygen that was produced by these plants. What was interesting was that when he exercised and he, he used more oxygen, the plants would produce more. They would take up all his carbon dioxide and, and increase their oxygen production as well. So there was this great relationship between the human being and the plant. So we said, okay, 15 days, so what? So we tried, he was in there for a while, and then we decided to do a 30, 60, and 90 day test in a 30 foot chamber. So this is three stories, and these three people lived in there 30, 60, and 90 days without any exchange of anything. So they had their food, everything in there. The, the water was being recycled, the air was being recycled, and we were successful. One of the pictures, though, that I like to show is that it wasn't just the three people. Just as, a, as an, an astronaut in space, it's not just the astronaut in space. There's a whole crew behind them that helped them. And this is the whole crew that it takes for these three people to survive for this period of time in, in, the, uh, in this type of environment. And again, it was pretty, pretty nice. They, they had a pretty nice living quarters, kind of like the Marriott of NASA there. So now let's go on to Mars. So early, early, this early Mars, oops, I, you know what? Actually, there's a video here. Let me start this. I forgot that this. Oh, okay. Oops, we don't have any. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Uh, should I wait then or? So the reason I like to show this one is because this is the early, the very early periods of, of, of uh, discovering, going to other planets. And so notice the difference. This is what they got back. This is how they figured out that they were on the surface of Mars by looking at numbers. Uh, it was very, very different. Uh, but anyway, since 1965, we've been sending uh, missions to Mars. And then they would get these small amounts of information and they would piece them together. And and then that's how they got their material. That's how they got their information. Um, so there's just more uh, examples of the different Viking one and two in 1976, and this will continue to go on throughout the years. Uh, some of the this is a, a lander, and again you can see how happy they are when they when they actually land and and realize that they're there. And then now, this is today. 1995, first they sent uh, many different uh, uh, orbiters around to figure out where they wanted to land. Well, this is an example of all the different missions that have been to Mars. So you can see there have been many since the early 60s, 50s uh, to, to Mars, from uh, orbiters to landers to rovers. Uh, these are three of the main ones here, um, the Odyssey, uh, the uh, Mars uh, Recognizance and the Mars Global Surveyor all had different purposes for uh, studying the surface. And this is some of the data that was brought back. One, one thing you can do is go to the Arizona State University Mars Education Area and you can find a lot of these pictures. Uh, they're really interesting. Uh, they show one thing that we 
early on when they looked at the surface of Mars, they actually um, thought that there was channels on there, that there was water. And now we know for, sure, for a fact that there was water at one time on the surface of Mars. And this is an example of how you would uh, infer that is by seeing these different flow patterns. And so again, you can see a lot of, quite a few gullies here, uh, which means that there was water on the surface. Again, more, more of these uh, flow surfaces. Uh, you can see them all, all over the surface of Mars. Again, these are high resolution images uh, that were taken uh, with some of those uh, orbiters and show some really great detail. Here's an example of some of the rovers, and you can see from the early sojourner how small it was to Curiosity, which is there, on there now. Spirit and Opportunity, one is still working, I think. Uh, I, well, actually, I think it's covered with uh, dust right now, and so they're trying to get it to work again. Again, it was only supposed to be 90 days, and I think uh, uh, Spirit or one of either Spirit or Opportunity is already on 10 years that has been working on the surface. So amazing, the 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 architecture, the the science and technology, engineering and math that, that occurred to allow these things to happen. Here's another, we're trying another video. <laughs> Hopefully this will, will drop it. This is a good video though, so I would like to show it. Okay, <laughs> sorry about when that. When people look at it. So this is a science, technology, uh, engineering, engineering mathematics uh, conference. Very uh, we're having technical difficulties. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought, but it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So. When we first get word that we touch the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive and dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic okay. drag. Okay, so our heat shield. It heats up and it glows like okay. the surface of the sun. Okay, right. 16. So okay, go ahead and use the 30 minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Because not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. We have a helicopter. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divergent. We fly off to the side. 
diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. Then we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. The precision is amazing. Yeah, it's all mathematics. Because if we were to descend propulsively, our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms, it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long, and then gently deposit it on its wheels, on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage, it's in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. So just get the... Don't don't go into. Okay. Okay. And here's a rover that landed on the surface. Curiosity. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster now. We're running out of time. We've lost a lot of time and technical difficulties. The next step would be why Mars. Because the possibility that there was water on Mars means that there is a possibility that there could be life. And so astrobiology is the scientific study of the origin, evolution, distribution, of, and future of life in this universe. And so what we were looking for is not human beings as we think of, but as uh, more like bacteria would be more likely what we'd find on Mars. So one of the things that we did was we went to extreme environments. And one of the extreme environments we went to was uh, in Rio Tinto, Spain. And so what we did is we actually did some drilling into the surface there in Rio Tinto. And I'll explain why in a minute. But th what we were looking for were anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that would live without oxygen. So again, as we think about life on Earth, we think about oxygen. But there actually are bacteria that can live in extreme environments, such as no oxygen. They can live in radioactive areas. They can find them in, in radioactive uh, pools of water. They can find them in Antarctica. They can find them in the, in, in the geysers in, in uh, Yellowstone. They can find them in the most extreme environments. So why not on the surface of Mars? And so what uh, uh, Na Ames, NASA Ames did was create these, these drilling machines, and we took them to Rio Tinto, Spain, and we tested them. Rio Tinto, you can see here, it's called, it's called Rio Tinto because of the red color, and it's red because there's a lot of iron in the water. So just as on Mars, there's a lot of iron, there's a lot of iron in Rio Tinto. Another interesting thing about Rio Tinto is that the pH of the water is very low, which means it's very acidic. And so again, we have bacteria living in these acidic environments. And so what we did is we developed these different instruments. This is one of the instruments we developed that was able to, this little guy right here was able to detect bacteria. And so we were able to see if there was bacteria that we were finding in the, in the surface of these areas, and which we did. Uh, again, these are just some more pictures of the, the different um, parts of the uh, drilling rigs. And it took, again, operation teams, as always. So from then, so we started thinking about, well, let's, let's look at bacteria as a way of, of uh, a source of, of, of producing oxygen and things like that. So we started working on different types of bacteria, cyanobacteria, to produce oxygen and came up with different solutions uh, to produce oxygen and how much it would require a bacteria, how big of an amount would be needed to grow this bacteria. So we came up with these little cubes. And each one of these cubes has small little layers in there, and each one had a growth of bacteria on there. And so you were able to produce enough oxygen for humans to live. Another thing we were looking at is using these actually for removing aluminum silica. So what we could do is we could uh, mutate these bacteria to prefer certain things. And so what we did was we created a bacteria that liked titanium. 
So that way we could take it to the moon and mine b b back, uh, titanium using bacteria. Uh, and then again, we could also use uh, bacteria, the cyanobacteria for creating methane, which would also be a source of fuel for future launches. So these are many of the different ideas that we had at NASA to try to live on other planets. And then another thing that, just for the fun of it, I decided, well, let's work with Nopal and see what we could do. And so Nopal, we, we started working with, and we were able to produce quite a bit of oxygen. One, th one problem that they have on space station, well, there's several problems, but one is that the, there is a high content of carbon dioxide, higher than on Earth. And so we, what we did was we increased the amount of, of um, carbon dioxide that these uh, plants were grown in. And, and we were able to produce quite a quite healthy um, nopal, and and so it was interesting. We brought a nopal expert from Mexico down, and he showed us how to make yogurt and tortillas and all kinds of foods with it. He also made shampoos with it. He did all kinds of things. So with one particular um, cacti, we were able to produce food, produce uh, materials, other materials for living. And, uh, and another thing that the, 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 na the indigenous people had always used is the coagulant from the nopal. And they would put it in the water when they, when they clean their clothes, and it would, it would coagulate all the soil. So you could, it's a good way to clean your clothes as well. And so this is something that they learned from the indigenous people that they could use in space. So that was the whole purpose of this, this one little uh, opportunity we had. They gave us 20K to, to play with, and we came up with this idea. And so now I just want to go into what I'm doing here now. So since I've been here, I've been working with students to study Popocatepetl because it is one of the most active volcanoes right now in Mexico. And as, as you can see, it's been very active lately. And so we want to understand why, what, if there's changes in activities, is there a way to predict uh, eruptions? And so we're using high altitude balloons in order to do this. Uh, here's an example, a picture of Popo as it is exploding. Um, and that's one thing it is, is it emits both uh, uh, sulfur dioxide and, and carbon dioxide and, and some uh, hydrogen sulfide as well, which is a very uh, toxic gas. So we want to be aware of these changes. So what we do on the balloons is we actually have, uh, uh, well, these are, here's some of the launches. So far we've done eight launches um, from here. Um, in different areas, you can see we've gone. It all depends on the winds, because we try to, to, to make sure that the, the uh, balloon um, goes over the crater. And so we have to study the winds and try to figure out when we can launch in order to go across the crater to take these, uh, these analysis. And so we've gone to all these different places, depending on the winds. And, and then they've ended up in some weird places. One of them that we did not get was one that fell in Michoacan. We saw that it was in the area that didn't look very uh, safe. We sent the state police out there, and they didn't want to get it. So we said, well, we'll just leave that one there. So out of eight, we lost, we've lost one um, so far. So these are some of the examples of the different teams that we've worked together. This was our very first uh, uh, mission, and we used to call them CANSATs because they were in the shape of cans. And uh, the University of Pacific uh, created a, a camera system here. UPAYAP created a system that had uh, radios and uh, cameras to send back information. And we did, created a really small one. Well, actually, I did it by myself. I'm not an engineer. I found it. I found this online. The 3D printed it and did wired it by hand. And it had uh, small sensors, temperature, um, humidity, and it also took pictures as well. But it was our first successful uh, Launch and it was in, in Lovelock, Nevada. From then we started, uh, here's a picture from up, up on about 100,000 feet of the different um, uh, payloads, Upaya payload here. SWE is a Society of Women Engineers. They created this one. And then our little uh, Tierra Luna one. I used to work for Jose Hernandez, the astronaut. His company is Tierra Luna. Uh, and from then on we went to the second mission, even more, more um, extensive data being collected. We were actually collecting data real time, both uh, gases, uh, gas concentrations, imagery as well. And then th the third one, uh, not too long ago. And here's some pictures. What we did was we actually uh, launched on another balloon, a drone. And the drone went up to 18,000 feet. We released it, and it actually 
uh, went around the uh, crater and was able to take these pictures that you see here. So, and then this is a kind of an example of the, the growth of the, of the different uh, uh, payloads that we have sent up with just barely cameras all the way now to these, uh, uh, what do you call it, infrared cameras, quite a few different uh, microcontrollers, gas sensors, real-time uh, telemetry, so we were getting data back real-time and, and storing it as well on SD cards. Uh, and then something that we've done recently with the students here is we've created these Pong sats, and I'll show you in a minute that, that system. But again, what we're doing is, 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 is showing young students, high school students, that they also can create their own satellites. And so here's some pictures, just some pictures of the events. Pre-launch, getting everything ready, uh, and then, then we do a prediction of the, the, the launch and where it's going to, where we need to launch from and where we will land to get over to the, the crater, which is right there. And then uh, this is just some of the software that we use for helping us uh, figure out where we need to launch and land, where to land. Field prep, you can see again that we use uh, the Yagis to collect the data real time. And then this is some of the different payloads that were sent up. And then we use uh, balloons filled with helium. And then it takes a team, quite a few teams uh, of people. And then we launch, well, and I'm scared to show this video, but so I'm not going to show it. But anyway, it would have been a launch video. Uh, and uh, here is uh, pictures of the different Yagi antennas for collecting the data. And then the larger antennas are for video. And here's actually video being broadcast from the, from the uh, balloon itself. And so what are we doing? So what we want to do is we want to take high resolution imagery so that way, oops, so that way we can uh, notice changes in the volcanic uh, activity over time. If we see changes in the topography, if we see changes in, uh, if there's a dome being created, and then we'll be able to see that. And infrared allows us to see changes in temperature. Is there increased temperature, which could be increasing lava flow? And then the gases also. If you see increases in gases, what is that saying? Potentially there could be a, e, some kind of eruption. More pictures of the popo. And this is the crater over time. These have been taken, Santa Pred sends uh, planes over pretty regularly, but it's very dangerous. And so what we're designing are drones that can do the same thing that they're doing with pilots, and they would be less dangerous. And so that's part of the work that we're doing here as well. Uh, infrared photography as well. We started working with the University of Colima. Colima uh, uses drones as well to do the infrared imagery of the, the volcano there. Um, Volcan Fuego, I think it's called. And then we can also use imagery from space. This is actually an image taken from one of the satellites that's circling and tells us a little bit also about it, um, the volcano itself. And then this is, again, is a, a picture we took with the drone. And then the real-time gas sensors, again, showing the different electronics. And we got really small and smaller. And then we've uh, actually changed now. So we got away from doing the little CANSATs, and now we have actually s uh, these smaller um, boxes or uh, sub subsystems, and each one has different types of uh, experiments inside of them. Some have gas, some have, uh, we actually did some, some more solar panel testing. Uh, there's, uh, uh, we have um, GPS, so we know where we're at at all times, and we're able to track it real time as well. And then this, the students working in the laboratories, putting everything together. You might notice some of you, you guys are there. The pictures here, uh, and then the day of the launch, uh, again filling the balloon, preparing everything. It's a lot of fun, and then the hardest part is finding it afterwards. So we've had to go through some pretty crazy territory, and as you can see, uh, we have to have machetes and everything else. We used to do it by ourselves. Now we always try to get a, a local to help us, and so lately we've been taking locals with us because we've heard people or things following us around. I mean, you never know what you're going to find out there. And actually, we've noticed that sometimes when you're in the forest, you have a tendency of going in circles and not realizing it. So it is, it's, it's, it's the adventure part of it is trying to find it afterwards. But if we don't find it, then we don't get the data. So it's important to find it. Examples of data. And again, here uh, you can see that these are, these are temperature. Uh, this is temperature profiles. And so see, we got better here. We've lost, uh, we lost uh, quite a bit of uh, data because it was so cold. But as you can see here, we were able to collect data most of the time. 
So again, learning about insulation, learning about how to protect the equipment help, has helped us. And then some of the future testing, like I say, is what we want to do is with the drones actually uh, do what NASA JSC does with their cosmic dust uh, program and they're working with us. They're one of our uh, collaborators and we're going to place some of these dust collectors on these drones and then fly them through the, the craters to collect some of the ash and see if we see changes. Uh, from there, the future right now, we're creating a small one unit satellite. Uh, but what, we, what we, our plan is, well, we actually started, this is where we started trying to design this, this uh, very complex system and ended up learning how to do things with the balloons. And then now we actually got uh, a, a one unit uh, satellite that's now on the manifest and will be launched in, Aug in October of 2019. And what that, that satellite is going to test is a, a, a modem which will allow us, currently, as you saw earlier, you have Yagi's and you have to have line of sight in order to collect data. That's the way they collect data a lot of times now with the CubeSats. What we're hoping is that with this modem that, that UPAEP is creating, the first one, it will be able to communicate with a, a communication system called uh, Global Star. And they have a constellation of satellites around the Earth that are communication satellites. So what we can do is actually collect data, send it to Global Star. Global Star will then has a gateway down to the internet and we can collect the data or send uh, commands back to our satellite using the internet instead of a line of sight and only having s short periods of time. You have anywhere from one or two minutes to five minutes of time to collect data, send data back and forth. And so this would allow us to do it uh, with, with a lot more ease and for longer periods of time. And of course, download larger images as well. Because if you're, if you're talking about a five megapixel image and you're only at uh, you know, a very low baud rate, it'll take you forever to get that image. So this is uh, the future of what we want to do. This, this is a little bit about the, the student pro program. So we had the students at, with the UPAEP um, high schools create Pong sats, and inside these Pong sats are actually different sensors. And so inside the Pong sats, they had humidity sensors, they had temperature sensors, they had uh, acceleration sensors, compasses, and they had SD cards collecting all the data. So what it allowed them to do is produce their own small little satellites, launch them, and then they actually gave presentations on what they did. So this was the student launch. So what we decided to do, every other launch is going to be a high school launch and then we'll do a research launch. And then away he goes. And then when we collected it, we gave them back their data so that way that they could present it. And I don't remember if I showed. Well, so this is, this is actually their presentation that they gave to us a few weeks back uh, about what they did and, and their, their uh, testimonials of how, what, how they felt and, and, and what they were able to do. Anyway, that's the end of my presentation. I appreciate it. If you would like to work with us, we're looking for people to, that are interested in helping us in this project. If you like building things, if you like being out in the, in the wilderness, this is the place to be. There's my email address. Uh. Despierta. ¿Sabes qué día es hoy? Vas a transformar al mundo haciendo lo que amas. Vas a cambiar las reglas del juego. Vas a mover a otros. Busca. Crea. Innova. Vuela. El mundo te espera. Transformalo. Hazlo, UPAE.